Thank you very much for inviting. Um, thank you to uh, the originators of this initiative and uh, Alex for your introductions and setting the uh, discussion um, in the right framework. Um, I lead currently uh, in Novartis healthcare system engagement and capability building, but only a couple of months ago, I was um, uh, in Novartis Gene Therapies um, responsible for gene therapy public policy. So what I would like to share with you is my perspective um, from the Novartis Gene Therapies as a public uh, the policy um, the lead on, on this topic. Um, we will have a discussion about focused on the value of gene therapies and how healthcare systems are ready to embrace this value and make sure it materializes for the patients and for healthcare systems. Um, I'm glad that you already had first session uh, where you had an opportunity to go to the science of gene therapies, how it works and um, how it is manufactured. So I will not be focusing too much on that, assuming that the, some of the members of the audience today also um, attended the previous session. So if it's not the case, and if there are some uh, questions about that, and I'm happy to also address this um, later in the question and answer session. Next slide, please. So really, um, arrival of gene therapies um, uh, marks the change of the new era in medicine. This is a really a pivotal um, uh, point where we have a great opportunity today to treat some of the devastating um, rare diseases with huge burden on patients and societies. But also with that comes a hope that in the future, as science advances, the gene therapies could help us to address the burden caused from some of the common diseases which are traditionally um, currently um, treated with more um, traditional type of therapy. So that's, um, that's an important thing to bear in mind. That's really we are at the uh, pivotal stage now in the history of medicine. Um, gene therapies have a you know, bunch of different characteristics um, that our healthcare systems have not really uh, encountered before, and therefore they are not necessarily ready. So if you want to say this is a 21st century medicine and technology that we need to make it work for 20th century um, uh, healthcare systems. Um, the first of all, if we look at the, uh, the mode of administration, the conventional therapies, which most of them have been designed for chronic conditions, they require repeated um, treatment, repeated administration for months and for uh, years or for the length of the patient life. While gene therapies usually are a single dose and short course administration therapies. That has a big value for patients and for healthcare systems as well. And the other important um, dimension um, of the difference here is the mode of action. Most of the traditional uh, therapies uh, for chronic condition, they address the, the root, um, not the root causes of the disease, but they are symptoms and they try to um, uh, reduce the symptomatic burden on the patients. Uh, while the gene therapies, they treat the diseases at the root cause with the potential to hold the disease progression or um, even um, provide the curative um, outcome for the patients. Duration of the treatment is another important um, difference between the conventional gene therapies. Um, conventional treatments um, must um, uh, continue in order to for them to exert the effect. So sustained effect is only possible if you continue treatment with this uh, therapies, like you know, cholesterol lowering therapies or um, the uh, cardiovascular high hypertension management therapies and et cetera. While the gene therapies, um, it's a basically one-time intervention with multi-year benefit, potential for lifelong benefit. And that's, uh, extremely valuable for patients, and especially the patients with the type of diseases that gene therapies are currently designed for. When it comes to access, um, conventional therapies really uh, shape the way the current value and economic assessment um, uh, works 
that is usually the way the patient gets access to these um, therapies. The value assessment processes that are established, they are really tailored at the, uh, the type of evidence that are usually generated from RCTs, a very robust evidence on the effectiveness from the beginning. Well, gene therapies are challenging that, being, you know, greater uncertainty in long-term outcomes and novel study designs um, are not always um, easily um, uh, managed by the established value assessment um, uh, mechanisms. And then when it comes to the, the payment, um, the uh, traditional therapies are, uh, because they have to be taken for the course of their life, um, and you know, the, the systems that we have currently to pay for those are designed for this type of therapies, while the gene therapies, which are the single administration, they require upfront uh, payment for the whole value of it. And that's also makes it completely different animal, if I may say, from uh, the conventional therapies. The next one. Um, very briefly to touch and refresh uh, perhaps the um, uh, discussion that you had during the first session. Then when we are talking about gene therapies, we are basically talking about four modalities through which uh, gene therapies can exert influence. We're talking about the gene replacement, when uh, uh, the function of a dysfunctional or missing gene is replaced with the functional copy of, of a gene. Uh, this very often um, uh, designed for monogenic diseases. Gene addition, when um, additional therapeutic gene is introduced that targets specific elements, mechanism, and disease pathway. Uh, gene inhibition, um, we mean by gene inhibition silencing the expression of a mutated gene. And then gene addition, um, editing the gene, which means the patient genome is um, edited to correct the specific mutation that causes a disease. We don't go into the kind of detailed science of that, but I just wanted to put it out there as a kind of a definition of the four um, major modalities of gene therapies. Currently, most of the gene therapies are for monogenic um, rare diseases, but we see their potential also in some um, the the other diseases, but science is not in there. Whether we will get there successfully or not certainly will depend on how the markets and healthcare systems um, embrace the current early birds of gene therapies and what kind of incentives the innovators and developers will see in pursuing the relentless search for um, application of gene therapies into uh, other um, more public health related issues. As I said, we are not yet there, but we might be there if we uh, create the right pathways um, for gene therapies to uh, deliver the value to patients and health systems and the incentives is there for the innovators. Next slide, please. <coughs> As I said, let's switch gears and talk a little bit more on uh, the value of uh, gene therapies. Gene therapies generate a high expectation from the society. We expect them to be very effective than some of the traditional therapies, uh, particularly the efficacy of the treatment, uh, the effectiveness of the treatment is very much determined by the time of the initiation of the treatment. And many of diseases, as um, we know already from the previous section, are um, genetic diseases. They have a certain manifestation time, certain leg time. Earlier, we initiate the gene therapies, particularly at presymptomatic stage, the greater the chances of their the efficacy. The clear example of it for is the spinal muscular atrophy, when by the time uh, that the children are diagnosed, maybe 90% of the neurons are already uh, dead. So if we could do that at an early stage, we certainly would have a much higher chances of preventing the lifelong disability. Um, society also expects from gene therapies favorable balance of efficacy and safety. There is the expectation that we know this is going to work. The, there are certainly some possible um, uh, side effects of, uh, of, of the therapy, but overall, the, uh, the promise of the benefit is greater than the risk. So this is also the perspective that regulators embrace. Um, there is an expectation of durable response. Um, it's hard to have that evidence at the time of the approval of the medicine, but what we know about the physiology, biology that underpins the science of gene therapies, um, it is highly likely that they have a durable and sometimes the lifelong impact. And a targeted treatment, this is really an epitome of the 
personalized medicine, if you will, because this is specifically uh, targeting the root cause of the disease. So all these factors would make the gene therapy um, uh, as something that um, is most likely to deliver very high value for the patients. And if you look at this, some of the studies that they've done recently, the average uh, quality of life gained from gene therapies, it's almost 10 times higher than the quality that are gained from the uh, conventional therapies. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. So that's as far as the patient value is concerned. So superior clinical efficacy and probability of giving the lifelong benefit. Let's look at the healthcare system value. Next slide, please. The economic impact of gene therapies, and which is particularly important for healthcare system, uh, depends on what aspect of the patient value they are mostly enhancing. So we have on the one side, the length of the life. There are some gene therapies that predominantly might work on extending the um, length of the life. Um, and in this case, the gene therapies are generating the substantial increases, but if that length of the life is extended without a significant increase in patient's quality of life, and without significant increase in the prob decrease in the probability that patients will have to continue using the other supportive healthcare, probably there is not so much of economic gain from that, but there is a huge patient gain from, from this therapy. But there are the gene therapies that can actually extend significantly the quality of life patients, make patient pretty much symptom free um, and enable patient to return back to the normal life. And this is the huge economic gain for the health system and for the society. Usually there are no such strict boundaries between the types of gene therapies. This is basically um, a put here for um, helping you to understand in which directions this patient value can finally materialize into the economic value. Gene therapies that extend both life of the patient and also quality of life of the patient are the ones that have tremendous value for patients and very big economic value for the healthcare systems. So let's look at this a little bit more. Next slide, please. On this um, slide, um, you don't have to read everything on this one, what I will point out, which kind of visually what should um, come uh, um, quite explicitly from what you see here is the um, cost of the treatment of various gene therapies that already exist um, relative to the uh, cost of treatment from other non-gene therapy alternatives for those diseases. And the orange boxes show you at what point the price of the gene therapies will equate the cost of the alternative treatment um, for, for this disease. And as you can see, pretty much all those therapies that are put on the chart between five to nine years, um, the cost of the, of the one-time cost of that will, equal, will kind of balance the uh, treatment cost of the, um, the, you know, of these diseases through traditional therapy. So <coughs> if we think that um, for, you know, whatever the gene therapy you might pick from this list, these are the, let's say, most expensive therapies. Actually, the other side of that, they might be um, not so much of expensive therapies, they might be high price therapies, but they might end up being actually the most um, cost effective and least expensive way of managing that patient uh, over the course of life by the healthcare systems. So that's kind of the, the other side of the coin, high price, but um, the, over the lifelong um, uh, course of the patient, they could be actually the most uh, cost-effective, efficient way of treating them. So as you can see, the healthcare systems are certainly gaining a huge benefit after five to nine years um, of, of uh, you know, the, from that perspective um, with gene therapies versus the traditional treatments. Next slide. We are also asked very often the question, and um, uh, this was something that researchers themselves got very interested, what is going to happen to healthcare systems if the current pipeline of gene therapy research and uh, development pipeline continues as it is? And um, this is a study that was done by Wong and um, uh, colleagues in the US. 
Um, we could also extrapolate it uh, for Europe, but I just wanted to show you whatever was in the paper and the evidence rather than uh, my personal extrapolation. The bottom line here is that gene therapies are not going to the best healthcare system budgets. They will not bankrupt the budgets. And the budget impact from those would be relatively small. If we consider into account and take into account that all those clinical programs that are currently in the pipeline will end up uh, successful, by um, 2034, we will have about 306 billion um, total spending over the 15 years on gene therapies on annual basis, about 20.4 billion in the United States. But if you consider that the United States um, by the time will be spending about 6 trillion on healthcare, so just if you take a single year as an example, let's say 2028, in 2028, based on this projection, we expect that the um, uh, projected tax revenues from all the gene therapy related activities in the uh, US would be, um, you know, sorry, the uh, cost of the gene therapies relative to the tax revenues would be only 0.44%. And projected, um, you know, the, as a percent of the healthcare spending, only 0.39%. So the question to you do you consider um, the spending on gene therapies, which has, as I mentioned earlier, quite a big health um, gain potential for the society, especially in 14 years from now, 0.33% um, as a something that is challenging healthcare system sustainability and the, uh, the budget impact. And uh, the picture looks um, most likely the same for Europe. That's highly unlikely that the, in, let's say, 15 years from now that we'll be spending uh, with more than 0.4% uh, uh, of our uh, budgets, healthcare budgets, on gene therapies. And consider the value that they can bring for that. So the clear answer to that, based on this projection, is that uh, it's not going to challenge our healthcare sustainability. And these are the very um, uh, still, um, uh, I would say, over projections, because not all those uh, mm -hmm. Clinical programs will more probably materialize, and the, we expect there should be uh, price uh, challenges as well. So um, the least price that went into the assumption of this based on the early um, examples of gene therapies will not be the same, let's say, in 10 and 15 years' time. Next one. So let's talk about the, um, you know, in the next two, three slides, what are the current big challenges the gene therapies currently face in healthcare systems? Um, I mean, traditional models, um, when we look at the therapies, basically um, have the three elements to that. First is the, the clinical inquiry. Is, um, um, the, is this product uh, working or not? And here, the gene therapy, when it comes to the um, gene therapies, there is a challenge, uh, not only on the economic side of it. Because if we look at the um, HT agencies versus regulators, they have slightly different perspective, right? Regulators are looking at the benefit and the risk, while the HD agencies are more interested in relative effectiveness and the, the uh, value for money. And the gene therapies, um, uh, were, which have inherent uh, uncertainties in the data at the time of this assessment, are somewhat disadvantaged here if we don't uh, change the paradigms that are currently used in the economic, um, uh, the clinical and also the economic appraisal. Um, we don't have a lot of comparative uh, data at the time of um, uh, the bringing this therapy to the appraisal stage. We don't have um, you know, comparative assessment to the other um, the therapies. Usually they are not based on the RCTs. So um, looking at it from the traditional lenses would certainly put them at a disadvantage. The same goes for the economic um, uh, appraisal, right? Because price is usually negotiated up front and the, the key considerations that are um, driving the economic uh, impact is the budget impact, uh, short term, um, the cost impact for the, for the payer um, and benefits to the families and wider societies are not always considered. Um, and that's again puts the gene therapy in relatively incompetitive position compared to the traditional ones. The short-term view is at odds with this long-term um, potential benefits and potential curative benefits that with one administration lacks for the, um, the, the last for the, uh, the, the life of the patient. And then financial dimension also very important because our healthcare systems are used to pay continuously like a rent for the therapies 
as long as the patient therapist uh, are taking therapy, you pay for that. You stop the therapy and the value stops there for the patient. And then, you know, you stop payment as well. Well, in gene therapies, all the value is actually at one time is um, transferred to the patient and health system and the payments um, uh, are, you know, the, the price reflects that one time value. So how we can manage that, which is not so difficult to be honest, to, to fix that uh, discordance between the, uh, the, the, the current financial mechanism and the way the gene therapy pricing is constructed. So these are the two, uh, three big challenges. So next one. Um, so what we need to do in order to fix this is basically look at the three things. Make sure that we have a um, much greater flexibility in the evidence requirements. We should be much more open to non-traditional um, uh, trial design. We have to accept some evidence gaps and mitigate them later on with perhaps the payment mechanism. And the other big thing is to have a much broader um, uh, value assessment frameworks um, to consider the patient's broader value, societal value, and not only focus on the traditional cost-effectiveness models um, that um, we have been using very often in relation to the traditional ones. And then innovative payment models are able to resolve many of those uncertainty issues as well as affordability issues. If we could mimic um, the a traditional payment mechanism in relation to gene therapies through a deferred payment mechanisms, um, installment payments. We could also incorporate some of the outcome dimensions you need to um, account for the um, potential um, uh, in, in uncertainties for the evidence. Those things could be um, addressed. So the question here becomes, are we ready to make these changes? Um, they are not um, uh, extremely difficult. They require just the political will um, and the collaboration. And from our side, um, as far as Novartis is concerned, I'm sure um, the same would go for the other industry players. We are really um, motivated and eager to play with these stakeholders together to come up with the solutions that works for the patients and works for the health systems and also works for us. So um, given that they, uh, we need to have some more time for the question and answers, I'll um, stop my um, uh, short presentation here and hand it over to the facilitators. Thank you very much.